Well, my name's Kerry Rappold. I'm the city's natural resources program manager, and uh, we're out here today for a wildlife tracking event. It's one of the few opportunities for folks to get on to the uh, actual site and see some of the work that we've done out here. Certainly, we had a lot of challenges that we faced in terms of designing this road project. We are crossing a large wetland area, the Coffee Lakes wetland, Wetlands Complex, and uh, so we had to keep that in mind as we were um, looking at various options for constructing this road. But today we're really focused on the uh, wildlife passages that we created with the project. And there's a number of uh, different types that we installed. Um, we're standing on the most significant one, that's the 400 foot long bridge. This one certainly provides for probably the most extensive movement under the road and uh, the most variety probably in terms of uh, wildlife that comes through here. But we also have some smaller passages. Uh, we have two 9 by 4 box culverts and we also have a variety of smaller culverts that are 18 to 24 inch. Um, Leslie will talk a little bit more about why we designed it that way, but basically we were trying to meet um, a very broad range of um, wildlife in terms of their needs, their requirements, and so um, certainly by having that variety, it's going to suit one species versus another, and hopefully we've met the, you know, the, biggest, uh, the biggest percentage of uh, needs in terms of those wildlife. Um, but we also have what's called an amphibian wall, and that wall, in combination with the fence above it, allows for the wildlife to be channeled along the wall and the fence, and then go to those passages. So it makes it a much safer environment for them in terms of funneling them to the locations that are most effective for moving them through. Um, about three years ago, we started on a partnership with Portland State University and uh, got to know this woman, Leslie Bliss Ketchum, who is uh, part, of the, part of the tour today. She's talking about her research. And uh, it's been a very successful partnership in working with Portland State. Um, they've provided data that's really critical to understanding the effectiveness of these structures. And we look forward to actually working with her in the future and uh, providing even more data to look at the effectiveness of what we've installed as part of this project. One of the first questions we wanted to answer was uh, what types of animals were using what types of passage structures here at Beckman Road. And so we wanted to not just, we didn't want to just focus on one species in particular. We, were hope, we wanted to look at a whole community of animals. So in order to do that, we had to use a variety of methods. And so um, one method that is really great at detecting medium and large sized animals are motion detect cameras. And so we have um, some of those set out on the landscape and looking at the passage structures themselves um, to detect animals moving through them. Uh, another method that we've used are sand tracks. Um, we put sand, white colored sand down on the landscape and, and those allow us to see what animals have moved by and what direction they were going. Um, and it detects everything down from um, deer mice and voles um, and then of course the deer as well when they step in it. Uh, another way that we've looked at uh, how what animals are doing on the landscape is by doing a mark recapture study for small mammals. Um, and we ended up focusing on deer mice and we captured those animals using uh, live traps. And then once they were caught, we um, gave them a tag um, in their ear that had a unique identifying number and then we'd re-release them. Um, and then do another capture session and see where we detected those animals again on the landscape. Um, so the first question that we had was, um, how effective are the passages and what animals are using them? Um, so far, um, last field season, we detected 16 animals using the passages, um, and that included um, everything from black-tailed deer, um, skunks, coyotes, um, short-tailed weasels, and uh, all the way down to the deer mice, the voles, shrews, um, garter snakes, um, uh, tree frogs, bullfrogs, um, a whole suite of animals that we've detected using the passage structures. Um, the other question that we had was, of the animals that we see using the passage structures, how many of those are actually representative of the animal activity in the area? And so what we did was we set up transects to monitor away from the road um, at different distances. And so the furthest one out is 100 meters, um, and the next closest would be 25 meters, and then we have one that's only about six feet away from the road, and another one that's six feet on the other side of the road. And so using those transects and comparing the information that we got from those transects to what we saw in the passages, um, we were able to see that there were only four species that we detected away from the road that we didn't find in the passages. Um, and those species were eastern cottontail rabbit, uh, nutria, beaver, and American bittern, which is a, a bird similar to a, a heron in its needs. 
And looking at where we saw those animals on the landscape, um, it seemed to be that the reason why we weren't seeing them using the passages was more related to the features on the landscape themselves rather than them avoiding the road or, or having some other issue with the road. Uh, the beaver, nutria, and uh, American bittern in particular are um, animals that use waterways for food and for shelter. And so we found those animals nearest to those waterways. Um, and then the eastern cottontail has a, uh, a preference for edge habitats on the edge of forests, and so that's where we detected that animal. Um, and so answering those two questions, what we found so far um, is that this particular passage structures, all these different passage structures, are highly effective um, at keeping this habitat permeable, allowing animals to freely move through and not be disturbed by the presence of the road. We um, are also looking at doing a, a pilot study um, out here this summer that looks at the effect of artificial light on animal movements um, on the landscape. Um, and so that's gonna start soon. Um, but there's a whole, uh, there, we've barely touched on all of the possible questions that we could ask at this location. It's a very unique site. Um, most locations where they put in passage structures typically include one size, and one type of passage structure, and they don't always include fencing to prevent animals from getting onto the road. Um, and so those things combined um, allow us to really look at the differences between the different sized passages, how effective they are, if there's a preference with a certain species using a certain type of passage. Um, and the fencing has so far really prevented animals from getting onto the road surface um, and being subjected to possibly being hit by cars. So we have uh, shrews, voles, mice for the small mammals, um, and then we also have a lot of common garter snakes, the guys with the stripe on the back. Um, lots of all different sizes of those guys. I think the biggest one I saw was almost three feet long. It was huge. Yeah, I caught it. I was like, oh, you're so cool, but I couldn't resist it. Um, <laughs> um, and then for amphibians, we've detected the, like I said earlier, there's there's bullfrogs, there's tree frogs, um, there's rough-skinned newts, uh, long-toed salamander, and northwestern salamander. Um, and then for the medium-sized mammals, we have um, possums, uh, striped skunks, uh, raccoons, um, and then some of the like little, a little bit more terrestrial birds that we've detected are quail, um, pheasant. There's uh, American bittern, um, which has a really cool call. Um, it's, it sounds like a like a water pump is how it's described. It's like boom, boom. I don't know how many are birders, but that's my best try at the American bittern. Um, and then of course the blue herons come through. Um, and then we also have um, coyotes and um, black-tailed deer, and we've even seen a bobcat out here once, which was really cool. Um, and then in the weasel family, or the medium rodents, we have nutria and beaver as well. Um, but then in one of my favorites, the mustelids, which is the weasel family, um, we've detected um, uh, mink once, and then we had um, short-tailed weasel several times. In fact, one of the times we were doing the mark recapture study with these little Sherman traps, we accidentally caught one. That was a very interesting experience because it was not happy. They're very small, they're ferret-like animals, and they actually it fit, just barely fit in a trap this big. And uh, when we were trying to get it out, it was fighting with the door and squealing at us, and they don't smell good, hence the name Mustelid, Musty. <laughs> um, but they are really, really amazing animals, and it's really exciting that they're out here because they're not very common. Um, so there's a lot of diversity. Um, and we, I know that there's some people that um, live close by that said they've seen river otter. I haven't seen them here yet, but that doesn't mean, I'm sure eventually they'll come. Because so. it takes a picture every second. Um, and so if we pop open the bottom here, you can see that um, it's actually telling me that it's taking a picture, picture one of three, three of three. And so when I come down here to monitor, I turn them off and I change out these uh, flashcards. And um, that's where the data is stored. And so that's why I have to come out every so often. Also, we rotate the cameras around the site. We don't have enough to put a camera at every station um, and they cost a fair amount of money. And so um, we move them around and uh, that way we can cover the whole site with limited resources. Um, and so then when we turn them back on, uh, they're armed and they trigger on any kind of motion. And so sometimes I have to be careful about the vegetation. Um, in the area because if the wind comes through and there's a whole bunch of reed canary grass in front of the camera I'll end up with a thousand pictures of reed canary grass waving in the wind <laughs> Which is not a lot of fun um, And so then I just arm the camera and after about 10 second countdown, it's ready to go and uh, And then we'll end up with photos of whatever moves through and so when this opportunity came up and this became my focus 
Um, at first, the choice to do it was really because there was a need for it and it put me in touch with a lot of different, um, there's the road people, the engineering people, wildlife people. Um, but now that I've done it for a few years, this is it. This is the field that I'm gonna stay in. Um, both large ecosystem level, community level, um, keeping habitats connected, all those things are so important and work at so many different scales. Um, you know, you've got this local level here, that's really important, and then as you start to expand that and get further and further out, it still applies. The same ideas apply. Keeping habitats connected for the long, the, the large scale and, and uh, the long term is really something that's become really important to me and, and I think is important to a lot of people.